I can, uh, I can get blamed for a lot of things. I can get criticized for a lot of things. There's a lot of things about me that are really far from perfect. But one thing that I do not get blamed for or accused of is having a lack of passion. That has never been the case in my life. It is a strength sometimes. It is a, a failure at other times. Uh, but having a lack of passion is definitely not something that you'll you'll probably ever hear me being accused of. Uh, and if and if that is the case, either that person is lying or something is really really wrong with me, because that is just my natural that's my natural place. That's my natural bent. Uh, it serves well when you're a linebacker, and not so much in, in other ways. Uh, the reason I'm bringing that up is this this sermon series has been on my heart. I can't remember how long, honestly. It's months and months ago, and months ago, this this first started when God laid this on my heart. And I remember thinking when he when he when he did, I remember thinking, I don't really want to do that. I don't really want to talk about that. God, that's not fun. Um, it's not going to be easy for me. It's a hard subject for all of us. I don't really want to do that. And so when when God lays something on the pastor's heart months before he ever brings it to the church, and then you couple that with my natural bent towards being passionate, sometimes I can come out guns blazing, and you ain't really ready for it. But I thought you should have been, because I'm ready for it, so why weren't you ready for it? And uh, I just say that to, to kind of in encapsulate this entire month as we've spent this time on these hard subjects. I just say that to, to make sure that I reiterate that I do not come to these subjects and, and to this material flippantly or without compassion. Uh, I know that my, my passion can come across as a lack of, a lack of, um, a lack of tenderness and a lack of compassion for others. And that's not what it is, actually. My passion is coming from a place of care and concern for each and every individual that calls this church home uh, and for my own life and for, the, and for the mission that God has called us all to. And so if I have, uh, I, I'm not scared to step on your toes, okay? That's what the Word of God does. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if I have uh, been a little bit too much for you, too bad, suck it up. No, I'm just kidding. I just want you to know that I that I have been that I have approached this entire thing with a, with a with a, a ton of with a ton of compassion and a ton of concern for what we're talking about, and and I pray that, that it has landed well. Uh, so, here's a statement that you've never heard before: Jesus loves us, right? Jesus loved us. Jesus loved us and left heaven to come to us. Jesus was tortured and he bled. And, and he died for us to pour out his love for us and to display that righteousness, true Christ righteousness, can overcome sin and death. And he did all that. He did those things. And he did rise from the tomb. And the tomb is still empty today. And he does, and he is love. Those things are true. And we, are, and we are called as his people, as his followers, to take his truth, to take his good news to the world. Therefore, we think if we ever have the opportunity to make a difference for someone for Jesus, it would be a failure on our part to let them walk away. I think we think that. Because of who Jesus is, because of his compassion and his tenderness and his gentleness and, and, and the sacrifice that he made, and, and because we have this, this duty, this heavenly duty to take his word to the world, I feel like, we feel like it would be a failure to let someone walk away when we have the opportunity to share the truth of Jesus with them. Is anybody with me on that? Is anybody tracking with me on that? I'm not the only one that feels that way. Okay. That no matter, no matter what, we got to chase down and pursue anyone and everyone for the gospel of Jesus, no matter the cost, no matter the turmoil, no matter the struggle, right? But is that right? I think we feel that way, but is that right is the question for today. 
Ponder this for just one second. Have you ever thought about Jesus just walking away from people? Have you ever thought about that? That that, that, that happens? That Jesus just walked away from people? Did, have you ever read scripture where Jesus just walked away from people? I mean, I know that you know that he did, but have you ever thought about it in that context, that he is literally just walking away from people? I don't know if, if you've thought about that or not. Matthew 8, 34 through 9, 1 is a pretty important story. It's talking about Jesus casting out demons, and he throws them into the pigs, and the pigs run off the, the, the edge of the road, right, or run off the cliff. It says this in the middle of that passage. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, came to his own town. They didn't like what he did, clearly showing they weren't ready to receive his message. Went up to him, the whole town, and said, we would like for you to leave. And then Jesus said, you don't understand. I have the words of life, eternal life. You don't understand. I'm sent by the Father. You don't understand. I'm here to help. You don't understand. I can change your life forever. You don't understand. I'm going to the cross for you. You don't understand. I can forgive sin. You don't understand. I'm the Son of God. That's what Jesus says in this section, except that's not what Jesus says in this section. What does it say Jesus did? It says he left. I've never really thought about it that way. He didn't plead his case. He didn't try to convince them. They said they wanted him to leave, and he left. He didn't get into arguments with them. It wasn't time. He just left. They weren't ready, and he left. But then you've got Mark 15, 3 through 5. The chief priests accused Jesus of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Sometimes he didn't leave because he couldn't leave the situation. Sometimes he just didn't respond. Aren't you going to answer? They're accusing you of all these things. Aren't you going to say something? Aren't you going to do something about it? Aren't you going to plead your case? Aren't you going to justify who you are and what you've done? Aren't you going to refute what they've said about you? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. He didn't say, sit down, Pilate. Let me tell you who you are really dealing with here. I'm Jesus, and I'm a big deal. And you better recognize it, or it's not going to go well for you. He didn't say that. Not, not only did Jesus walk away, not only did he not always defend himself or preach when the opportunity came, he also let people walk away. You've heard, most likely, if you've been in church at all, if you haven't, there's a story of a guy who came up to Jesus and he said, hey, what do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And he says, I've kept all the commandments, bro. And Jesus says, oh, well, there's one left you hadn't. You hadn't sold everything you had. Go sell everything you got. Go sell everything you got and then give it to the poor and then come back and then you can follow me. At this, the man's face fell, it says in the middle right there. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? And then, he, and then he gives the meaning behind this. The meaning behind this is that it's impossible to be saved on your own. You have to be saved by God. It doesn't matter if you're poor or rich. The, the point is you have to recognize that you need God. And if you're rich, you may not recognize that you need God. That's the point of what he's saying here. But notice what didn't happen here. The, the rich, the rich young ruler turned and walked away. Jesus didn't say, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Wait, come back. We need your resources. We need you to start tithing. Come back. We need you to be a generous person in our group. Come on. Come back. Well, no, no, wait. You, you might have misunderstood what I said. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to walk away. I'm just saying... I, he didn't do that, did he? What did he do? Doesn't even acknowledge it. He walks away. The rich young man walks away sad, 
And Jesus immediately turns to his disciples and starts teaching. Just let him walk away. Over 40 times in the four Gospels, Jesus let someone walk away or he walked away. Over two dozen distinct times, times that aren't just copies of each other or the, or the same story told different ways by different people. Jesus didn't let the needs, pleas, attacks, or unresponsiveness of others distract him from the mission given to him by his heavenly Father, and neither can we. So what we've been talking about for the last four weeks is breaking free, breaking free from generational curses, breaking free from trauma, right? Breaking free from inner vows, inner vows. And we, and we haven't covered everything. You're not going to listen to that one message and then just be fixed. That's not how it works. That's how, in this silly little brain of mine, that's how I think it's going to work. That for months God's been leading up to these moments, and, we're gonna, and I'm, I'm going to preach a message, and God's going to give me the right words, and then it's going to prick your heart, and everything's going to change. That's what I hope, but that's not what happens. You know why that's not what happens? Because it's not my job. No matter what I do or say, the Holy Spirit's got to convict you, and you have to repent and turn to Him. Man, that is frustrating. It's frustrating. But it is what it is. We can't be distracted. We've been talking about breaking free from these things. Today we're talking about breaking free from toxic people or toxic relationships. And that's a buzzword in nowadays times, and I don't mean it necessarily the way it gets used in society. So to make sure that we're on the same sheet when it comes to this. So what is that? What is a toxic person? A toxic person is someone who is determined to steal, kill, and destroy. Determined to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, I'll, I'm going to give you a quick newsflash. That can be any one of us at any point in time. So this isn't the message of, Let's figure out who the bad guys are so we can hate them. Because the bad guy may be the person in the mirror. Okay? But as were the first three messages, we're definitely about dealing with ourselves. For the most part, this is about understanding that there are people in your lives that you need to learn how to deal with properly in order to fulfill the mission that God has laid out for you. So a, a lot of the terminology for today comes from a book by a pastor named Gary Thomas, just the terms that I'm using, um, and, and his book is called When to Walk Away, so I do want to just put that out there. Um, it's, a good, it's a really good book, and Gary Thomas says it this way when defining toxic people. They have a murderous spirit, they are control mongers, and they love to hate. Now, you don't have to be all three of those things to be a toxic person. You could just be have a really murderous spirit, or you could just be really controlling, manipulative would be the word that we would use mostly for that. Or you could just really love conflict. And, 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 and here's the other thing. Say this right off the top. For this type of message, you know, there's two people in the world. There's, there's people pleasers and there's people that, that don't really care if you exist or not. Okay? And, and I don't mean that like flippantly or, or funny. I, some of us I'm a people pleaser by nature, and it is a strength, and like all strengths, it is also a weakness and a fault. There are others whose, who, whose other people's opinions don't really affect them that much. They're, 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 they're words to them. It's like water off a duck's back, okay? So if you're in that camp today, you're going to hear this message and go, yeah, duh, that's what you do. These type of people, no big deal. But for the people pleasers that are listening today, this is going to be hard. Let's go ahead and tell you that. Not hard to hear, hard to go out and do. So that's what we think, that's what we're defining a toxic person as. John 8, 44 says this, For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has also hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Excuse me. Jesus said this about, about Satan and to some of the people who were following him at the time. That when, that when we do evil things, when we sin, when we are toxic, 
when we take it to that level, that we are acting like a son of Satan because that's where that comes from, which puts that, our behavior on a pretty gravitous level of, of, of thinking and consequence. And, and so, so that's kind of talking about toxicity. And then, and then in John 10, he says, the thief comes only to, you've heard this one, kill and steal, kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, drawing a stark contra con contrast. Now, in this, Jesus is, is not talking about Satan. We've talked about this before. I did a whole message on it. He's not talking about Satan. He's talking about false teachers in the church. He's talking about wolves in sheep's clothing in the church come to steal, kill, and destroy. But you put that with John 8, 44, they, they're working for Satan, whether they realize it or not. So it, it is de facto a description of Satan, but it's really a description of, of fake Christians. It's really the description of that. Those who come only to steal, kill, and destroy. From Gary Thomas, toxic people are often seemingly addicted to self-righteous, rash judgments and thus frequently fight with people instead of enjoying and appreciating people. They may be jealous of healthy people's peace, family, and friendships and spend much of their time and effort trying to bring down people down to their level of misery rather than blessing others with joy and encouragement. They often want to control you and it may feel as if they just want you to stop being you. That's Pastor Gary Thomas's definition. Toxic people consistently create chaos in their relationships. Consistently. They're addicted to conflict. They're addicted to discord. Toxic people are, are, are known for what they are against more than they are what they are for. Toxic people are unwilling to simply disagree with you. They want to silence you. Toxic people uh, attempting to stop you from doing or being what God has called you to do or be. They're going to try to get in the way of that. Toxic people want to steal and kill and destroy with control by possessing another person. They want to possess. They want to control. Do you know that only de demons are described that way in Scripture? Have you ever thought about that? That, that? I think we think of God sometimes as the puppet master because he is sovereign. But that's not really the way Scripture describes Satan, or describes God. It's not. He is sovereign. He is in control. He is ruling. He is reigning. He, his will ultimately will be done, and it will be done because of his grace, Romans says. But, but, but God doesn't, like, take possession and control you. That's what demons do. Scripture speaks of demonic possession, but not of God possession. It, it speaks of, of those who are surrendered to Jesus as king so that we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and then therefore we have self-control is part of the fruit of the Spirit, is to have self-control because the Spirit of God is in us. But Satan wants to have demonic control, demonic possession. God in his sovereignty, he gives man the opportunity to choose him or to reject him. It's choice because without choice, there isn't love. I've said that over and over, and I, the more I say it, the more I study it, the more I find it to be true. Here's what God's word says. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Joshua 24, 15. I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 30. John 7, 17, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teachings come from God or whether, whether I speak on my own. Toxic people want to steal, kill, and destroy, and they often exhibit a love to hate. Spiritually healthy people love and exhibit compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Toxic people love and exhibit anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying. You could put another word on toxic. You could just say evil. It's the same thing. That's what Scripture would call it. Scripture doesn't use the word toxic. Here's questions from, from Pastor Thomas to ask to consider when deciphering if someone is, is, someone is toxic. 
do your interactions with them require long periods to you, for you to recover from? Does your relationship with them destroy your peace, your joy, your strength, and your hope? Are they interfering with your ability for and participation in other healthy relationships? Do they exhibit a murderous spirit? Are they controlling? Do they manipulate you? Do you feel manipulated by them? Do you feel minimized by them? Someone who constantly belittles is toxic. Does the person seem to come alive when exhibiting anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language and lying? Do, do, do they just light up when they get that opportunity? Sometimes, whoop, the most toxic of people are those claiming to be on the right side. Again, this is coming directly, quote, unquote, Pastor Thomas. Satan's modus operandi is silencing and murdering with shame, ridicule, and malice, with no grace and no redemption ever. Still quoting, I've seen many people claim to do God's work while seeming to use Satan's methods. Man, that is a word of caution. People claim to do God's work while seeming to use Satan's methods. Silencing, murdering with shame, ridicule, malice, no grace, no redemption, ever. Now, let's make something very clear here today. I'm not saying everyone who sins is toxic. Because if that were the case, what's coming next? Then we all toxic. Every single one of us. I guess maybe you could take it that far if you wanted to, but that's not what we're trying to define today as. I'm not saying that everyone who sins is toxic. We are all sinners saved by grace. And that is not of ourselves, but the free gift of God through faith. So that's not what we're talking about. We're also not wanting to be the the special agent uh, sin detective trying to go around and point out everybody's sin and how they're wrong and what they need to do about it. Actually, I hope that you understand by the end of today that we are wanting to do the opposite of that, the exact opposite of that. But we are talking about being wise. We're talking about being discerning. And here's what that looks like. And it's a frustrating look at it. Proverbs 26 starting in verse 4, verse 4 and 5. Don't answer the foolish arguments of fools, or you'll become as foolish as they are. Be sure to answer the foolish arguments of fools, or they will become wise in their own estimation. <laughs> now, some of you, you know, Forrest taught me this a long time ago, to read a, read a chapter of Proverbs every day, right? There's, there's 31 Proverbs, so, you know, and, and you can double up on the last few days when there's not 31 days, but you can read through Proverbs a lot. And so you may have read through Proverbs a lot, and I don't know if you've ever slowed down long enough to realize what that says. Do I need to read it again? Isn't that contradictory? I mean, literally? <laughs> no. It's not contradictory. It's wisdom. That's wisdom. It's discernment. Sometimes when it comes to fools, you walk away. You don't say a word because it's a waste of time and energy. Sometimes in life, you have to be around them. You don't have the choice. Sometimes you live with them. Sometimes you have to participate in life with them. So sometimes you have to answer a fool's argument, knowing when and where and how and if is wisdom. Breaking free from toxic people in the right way at the right time necessitates discernment and wisdom. So wait, wait, preacher. Come on now. I'm not supposed to go around and be on constant guard against toxic people and pointing them out to everyone and cutting them all out of my life and publicly shaming them and ruining their lives because they're toxic jerks. No, you're not. And if you came here today hoping that's what I was going to say, then I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that is not what Scripture calls us to do, and that is not the example Jesus gave us. Check this out about our Lord and Savior. You know this. 
but have you thought about it? Jesus washed Judas' feet too. I know that goes around every Easter and gets used out of context most of the time. And usually it's used as, well, you should just let people run all over you then. I don't think that's what it means. I think that's what we think it means. I think we let people do that to us because we think that's what the loving thing to do is. But it also means that we're not to be the sin police. Jesus washed Judas' feet too. Why? Because the mission is more important than any man. Jesus' mission that he only had a certain amount of time to complete was more important than wasting his energy on someone who was not going to repent. From Pastor Thomas, Jesus used the two holiest hands that have ever existed, the two most precious hands in the history of humankind, the hands pierced for our salvation. Jesus took those exquisite hands and washed the feet of his toxic betrayer. Not long before he was about to betray him. Mm. Not only that, but this is where it really rubs me. This rubs me. Ooh, I don't like this verse. I don't like it. Here's some of the last words Jesus spoke to Judas in Matthew 26. Jesus said, My friend, go ahead and do what you've come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. Oh, man. It makes me mad. I wish Jesus would have been like, well, I can't tell you what I wish Jesus would say. Not from right here, I can't, because it comes from a bad place. I mean, at least I wish he would have been sarcastic, at least, at the, at the minimum. Like, hey, buddy, I don't think that's how he was saying it. Your mission, Jesus follower, is not to fight toxic people. It's to complete God's call in your life. God is for people. He is for you. He is for you. We sing the song. His scripture says it. God is for people in ways we just can't, we simply just don't get like this. Your calling is more important than winning a fight with a toxic person. You have been called to be a good steward of the life God has given you. You have finite time, finite energy, and finite ability. It cannot be wasted or distracted on every and any Judas in your life. And you'll have them in your life, for sure. But we can't waste time on that. The mission is too important. Jesus didn't spend time, his time and energy as a man on trying to stop Judas. He spent his time and energy investing in all the twelve with what they would need to be the apostles to the world to the point that one of the first things they were prepared to do after Jesus' ascension was replace toxic Judas. He didn't shield them from Judas. He equipped them with the wisdom to live and serve in a world full of them. He could have took Judas out but there would have been another one. Now, that doesn't mean that Judas or any other toxic person doesn't need truth. Jesus said in Mark 14, with Judas right there in front of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not even been born. He spoke truth. Or when Judas came to him in the garden, the same time that he calls him friend, he also says in, in Luke twenty two forty eight we get this detail. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? That's what friends do to each other in their culture. That's how friends greet each other. And, and Judas walks up and kisses him on the cheek to identify to the, to the mob, excuse me, to the soldiers who it is they're coming to grab. But what he didn't say is, Judas, you are betraying the Son of Man with a kiss, you little weasley, thieving, untrustworthy, ungrateful little jerk. I ought to call down a legion of angels to pluck out your eyelashes, and then I'll stop. See, that's how you know I'm not Jesus, because that's what I would have said, and I'd have kept on going. 
Again, we're, we're not called to be special agent sin detectors, pointing out everyone's sin and mistakes and labeling them as toxic. But when it directly affects things, or when you're directly involved, or when you're directly asked, then tell the truth. That's what we've been called to do. Like, I think you're being manipulative in this situation and you're not going to change my mind. And I got the guts to say that. Take the Holy Spirit I'm telling you right now. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about if that was your boss and you know your boss is manipulating a situation. You're, you're, you know you have the information. It's not speculation. It's not secondhand information. Or maybe it's just a colleague. Maybe it's not the boss. It's always the boss we blame. It's not always the boss. Sometimes it's a colleague. And in this situation, you have the information and you know that the person is using information and doing things in a manipulative way. And then they come to you and either try to get you to join in or justify what they're doing. If you want to break free from toxic people, you say, I think what you're doing is manipulative. I will not be part of it. And you're not going to change my mind. That takes some strength. Whoo! That's hard, isn't it? Am I the only one that thinks that's hard? That's hard. Here's the thing. Like, if you want to just group it up into one sentence. Choose service to God over submission to toxic people. You say, well, that's, that, some of you think, well, oh, that's easy. But it's not easy to do that. But we have to remember that because we have too important of a mission. We have too important of a mission. Here's the way Pastor Thomas describes our mission. What does this mean practically? It means when you and I wake up, God's agenda is more important to us than our agendas. And we dare not stop praying until that is so. Speaking of tonight, we weren't saved to feel safe or simply be freed from worry about our eternal destiny. Those things are true and precious, but in the here and now, we are saved to embrace this kingdom work. Christ died for all, that those who live should no longer live, no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That is 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Christ died for me and you so that we start living for him instead of ourselves. You and I do not own our time, our talents, our treasures. We are stewards. We are to expend all that we are and all that we have to participate in building in the building of God's kingdom. Whatever office God has placed you in, whatever household God has placed you in, whatever community God has placed you in, whether you are healthy or ill, wealthy or just barely making it, lonely or socially overbooked, life is richest when you give each moment of each day to God with the prayer let me receive your love and pour it out on these people so that I can represent you every minute of the day. Here's the part that Pastor Thomas says that just irks me. The early church wasn't defined by its sermons and songs. It was magnified by its mission, embraced by every member. I'm going to say that one more time because that needs to hit us right between the eyes and more importantly, right directly in our heart. The early church wasn't defined by its sermons and songs. It was magnified by its mission, embraced by every member. So what do we do when it comes to toxic people, people that want to control, people that want to manipulate, people that want to steal, kill, and destroy, people that want to use their position and their status or in your life or in the community to, to, to control and manipulate? Notice the word that keeps getting said. Toxic people like to control Control, control, control. What do we do about people that are controlling and manipulative and have murderous spirits and want to, want to hurt and harm and seem to enjoy it? What do we do? First thing you gotta do is identify the toxic behavior. That's why we've been talking about this. Not so that you can point it out, not so that you can shame them, not so that you can make them be the bad guy, so that then you can put that in the proper category. Okay, this isn't a bad day. This isn't X, Y, Z. This is, this is a person that is, that is working and living and behaving out of a place of toxicity. 
put it in that category because you handle that differently than you handle someone else. You, you approach it. You approach them. You talk to them. You approach the situations. Or you don't approach the situation at all depending on if this person is toxic or not. Identify so you know how to proceed. You can't interact with someone who is toxic in a normal way. They're unhealthy. You can't reason with them. You, you, can't, exp you can't explain it. You can't rationalize it away. It's not going to happen. It takes a different approach. You put, you put toxic in the toxic category. And if you can remove yourself, depending on the situation, then remove yourself. That's the simplest thing to do. It's not always possible. Or just set a healthy boundary. Here's how, here's how you can know if someone's not in a healthy place, bordering on toxicity or already there. When, when you set a healthy boundary in your life and they're mad about the boundary, usually a good indication. Know that they are, uh, 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 know that they are trying to manipulate you, so be strong in Jesus. Know who you are. Know who you are working for. Know who is in your category. And be wise. Be wise. Be wise. Be, know when to address it. Discern when to address it. Ignore it. Or remove yourself from it, if at all possible. And then, yeah, the third one, pray to forgive. Notice the pattern that keeps coming up all four weeks, and all the time for that matter. Pray to forgive. Pray to forgive. You don't get to determine what the outcome is for someone. You're not judge. God is judge. We are to forgive. That doesn't mean that you have to continue to let them dump on you. That doesn't mean you have to continue to let them abuse you. That doesn't mean you have to continue to let them manipulate you. You should not do those things. But we are to forgive them. We are to forgive them. And let all that means is you're saying, God, you determine the outcome. I don't get to do that. That's not my right. Doesn't mean that you like it. Doesn't mean that it's okay. It means you don't get to determine what happens. And then the last one is ask God to make you tender. We act differently when we know we are dearly loved. Desire to be tender. I'm going to give you a quick story about a guy named Doug, not Doug Miller. Just a guy named Doug. I'm lifting this from the book. This is what Doug said about himself. My anger perme permeated every relationship, from my wife and son to supervisors, peers, subordinates, and every random people, all the random people I encountered in day-to-day -day living. I was always ready to be angry. Little things like a lawnmower not starting or a misplaced wrench were once massive problems for me. I looked for things to, I looked for things to be angry about, or my anger wasn't in proportion to the severity of the offense. It was all or nothing, and usually that meant all. I look back on it now, and I don't understand why I was so consumed by it, but I think it was rooted in not being in control. It was certainly more severe when events were outside of my control. A flat tire was a reason to rage. An unexpected delay or change of plans involving work was caused to unload on my employers. Production goals not meeting my expectations through my anger. And he goes on and on and on. And it gets worse. And Doug, Doug for various reasons, developed a, a, a habit of, of viewing pornography as a married man. But he began to figure it out through God's sovereignty. He realized his pornography habit was, was truly hurting his wife, like hurting her on the inside. He had a, a pastor speak loving truth into him. The pastor asked him to write an apology letter to his wife, a small first step. Instead of being an apology about using porn, it became a seven-page letter apologizing for all the ways he had been failing her as a husband. It was a clear first step towards healing. Through this pastor's guidance, he, he surrendered to Jesus. He began a recovery class about addiction at the recommendation of the pastor. It wasn't all smooth sailing. It was bumps in the road. There were things that were hard. There were setbacks. There were things that Doug messed up, even as he's working towards healing and working towards leaving his toxic behavior in the past. But he began this class, and instead of anger and abuse and bullying being his go-to, Doug began to learn to be patient and listen 
and giving up control and everything. He began to learn to identify emotions rather than just covering everything up with anger. Men, we need to hear that one. He began to identify emotions rather than just covering everything up with anger. And now, Doug says, I have a real marriage. It gradually improved, though there were some, uh, there were some overnight changes that were more dramatic, but it gradually improved. Some things fast, some things not so much. We are much better at communicating with each other. I'm better at boundaries. I'm better at speaking out, of, speaking out if I'm hurt, but not in a retaliatory way so that the problems get resolved instead of getting worse. Instead of talking over my wife, I talk to my wife. The difference in our marriage, the difference in our marriage has been like night and day because we were married in legal terms only. We weren't close. We didn't share our feelings. It was very much a roommate situation. We're close friends now. Doug changed his work environment completely. Went to a different place where he, where he didn't have to have control over things, where he didn't need to have control. Now he sleeps at night. He said he gained friends for the first time in 20 years, real, true friends for the first time in 20 years. Our behavior affects more people than we realize and on deeper levels than we realize and we must be aware of it when it comes to toxicity when it comes to someone who is bent on stealing ki killing and destroying on controlling on manipulating on doing things that are described in scripture as demonic possession we need to be wise in those situations and if we can remove ourselves or set a boundary of you can't this is this is no longer tolerable in our lives then we need to do that if, if we get asked to join in or what do you think about said behavior we need to tell the truth and address it and then most of the time we, we just need to we just need to act in love and have compassion and tenderness for the situation Understanding that some everybody's got a backstory. Everybody's got everybody's gone through hard stuff. Everybody everybody goes through seasons of things that are difficult and hard. We don't need to be the secret sin police. And then the last thing I'm going to say, and I'll be done. Don't be toxic to yourself. Some of some of us that's our worst thing. We're 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 kind to everyone else, except for the conversations we're having inside of our own heads. I'm so weak. I'm ashamed of myself. I can't be loved. Why would anybody ever want me? I've messed up too much. No way God can love me. No way I can be redeemed. Those conversations with ourselves are just as, if not more damaging than toxic people around us. God came to redeem. Yes, he created. And there was a fall. And we'll stay in this fall until he comes back. But God came to this earth to redeem to buy you back, to purchase you to God. And he says that he wants no one to perish, no, not one. And that includes you, and that includes me. I'm going to pray, and we will finish with the song of invitation. You will need to come pray. Please come pray. And I will remind you one more time. We've talked about a lot of hard stuff over the last four weeks. Tonight we want to spend some concerted, concentrated time in prayer praying about and praying through some of these things. Some of you have had boxes opened that are hard boxes. And we, and we want to take the time to allow God, through His manifest Holy Spirit presence in front of us and with us tonight, to heal in ways that only He can and to give us His strength. So I ask you to be here tonight if at all possible father god we thank you and we love you and we do god bow before you